Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion from John chapter 20. We are kind of wrapping up our look at the book of John, and we will very soon be moving into new territory. But for today, we are still in John, and we are going to be talking about Jesus appearing to his disciples after he is raised from the dead and the command that he gives to them, mostly to forgive or not forgive sins. And we'll be getting into that today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we get into our reading, what I want to do is, we haven't done this in a little while. We're going to be reading uh, these sections here, the second half of John 20. I want to just touch on the first half, because there's going to be some contrast, especially uh, in between the latter half of the section we haven't read, or won't read, or didn't read, or maybe you read if you read, congratulations. And the first part of the section we will read. So in this first part, uh, Jesus raises, rises from the dead, although there is just the empty tomb. Uh, the women, although in this one it's just Mary Magdalene, interestingly enough, is the only one mentioned. But the women come to the tomb very early. They don't see Jesus. They run back. Uh, Simon and John, he never calls himself, he, yeah, anyway, John, go to the tomb, they don't see it, uh, they did not understand the scripture, right, that he must rise from the dead. Mary gets to see Jesus, the first one, the first person to see the risen Christ is Mary Magdalene, who was, interestingly, the first person going to the tomb. Now, I don't want to get too much into this. Um, if we had covered this half, I would get much more into it. But suffice it to say that Mary sees Jesus, and we're gonna we are gonna read verse 18. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, "I have seen the Lord," and that He had said these things to her. Because we want to set. Uh, I use a lot of literary terms, so I'm just going to use another one. We want to set the scene. There we go. I guess I'll use that for our reading. And that would be Mary having seen the risen Christ and having uh, fallen down at his feet and having heard from Jesus now goes and tells the disciples these things. So here we go. Starting at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now the reason that I uh, went on a little while about Mary is because the disciples kind of act as if none of this had happened. Right? We could have very easily... Uh, headed to the start of our reading and read through it, and it reads as if none of this happens. 
it's very strange. Very, very strange. Uh, Peter and John run to the tomb. They Now, this is interesting. Then the other disciple, this is verse 8. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. Now, it's interesting. What exactly did he believe? They didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So it, there, there's something of a, a, a coming to terms, I think, with the resurrection of Christ. And it's very strange. Um, now, I, I would kind of group the crucifixion in with there, but the disciples almost, it's not, I don't think it's that they're not willing to, they're just hesitant to believe that he has risen from the dead. And I think this really harkens back to, you know what, I'm going to pause and find that because this is important. Okay, uh, this is in John chapter 2, and Jesus has just cleaned the temple. Remember, John is looking at Jesus categorically, uh, meta, meta, in relation to various metaphors. What does it mean for Jesus to be the light of the world? What does it mean for Jesus to be the bread of life? What does it mean for Jesus to be all these different things? And he is not recalling the life of Jesus chronologically. The reason I say that is uh, because this event does not happen right after this event. John's Gospel is not chronological. It is more categorical. Um, uh, I don't want to use the word metaphor lest you think that it didn't literally happen. Um, topically, that's the word I want. Topically. So anyway, this actually happens during Holy Week, this Jesus cleansing the temple. But here's where I, here's why I brought us there. Verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So this thing, uh, they were at a loss. And the religious leaders actually, let's take, right, they're grumbling as uh, religious leaders sometimes do. Um, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it in three days? Arr, who do you think you are, young man? Um, nobody realized that he was talking about the temple of his body. And it's not until after the resurrection that his disciples remembered and they believed the scripture. So we come back to John chapter 20 and it's this difficulty of believing without the resurrection. I think that's maybe the best way to say it. That the resurrection is central to, is necessary for trusting in Jesus. I think I can say that. I'm going to go ahead and say that. The resurrection is necessary for um, proper understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done. That's the way I want to say it. And that very much harkens to Luke 24, when Jesus opens their minds to understand the scriptures and says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, hi honey, must be fulfilled, right? It's after the resurrection that they finally kind of understand the holistic prophetic nature of scripture pointing to Jesus. So anyway, I've said a lot without actually saying anything about our text, but I want to I want to set this up because what I don't want to do is just like poo-poo the disciples. Oh, you silly adjective disciples. Why aren't you more adjective, right? Um, I think this is a very reasonable reaction for th that they are doing. Uh, I think it's a bad reaction, but I think it's very reasonable. Anyway, Jesus comes and stands among them, and he twice says, peace be with you. Because again, there's something of, in you know, verse 19, we have peace be with you, and he shows them his hands on the side, and then they're glad. Like, oh, yeah, you are Jesus. That's a, that's a good thing. I'm glad you're here, Jesus. And so then he has to repeat himself. He doesn't launch into, and I think Jesus is encountering and overcoming this this hesitancy of belief, this kind of forced hesitancy of belief. Because he could have just whoosh, headed straight away with his thing, 
but he gives them some space, some time and space. In verse 19, he just says, peace be with you. And then, I don't, I don't know how he does it exactly, but he shows them his hands, right, and his, and his side. You can't see my side down here, but there's my side. And he gives them some time to react, to kind of process what's going on. Now, they've had the report from Mary, and then Peter and John going and seeing the empty tomb. And then they've had Mary again, twice in one day. Well, the first time negatively seeing an empty tomb, and then the second time positively actually seeing Jesus and talking to him. And they need some space to just kind of situate all these things properly. And Jesus gives them that. And then, and, and then they can move forward. Then they move forward. Okay, he has, verse 21, he has work. He has work to do. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now, what I want to focus on are his words in here, and, and then we'll get into it. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, Jesus says this, to his disciples, although not to Thomas. And, and we'll kind of get into that. Says this to his disciples to forgive and withhold or retain sin. To forgive the sins of people who are penitent. I'm using a lot of fancy church words. Forgive the sins of people who are sorry for their sins, who recognize the wrongfulness of what they have done and who want to uh, follow what God says, and then to withhold or retain sin for people who are not sorry or who do not want to stop following their way and follow God's way. Those, those are the two cases. Now, the reason why I mentioned Thomas is, um, so let me, let me just say what I'm saying and then I'll say this, that as a pastor, um, this verse applies not just to those 10 disciples, again, Thomas wasn't there, but as Christ's ongoing ministry to his people. And to say that I am the, the, the X generation recipient of this, that I also, as a pastor, have this command of Christ to forgive or to retain sins. And that really every pastor in the Christian church likewise shares in this command from Christ to forgive or to retain sins. Now the reason why it's important that Thomas isn't with them is there are some folks who say that this verse uh, 22 and 23 is just for the just for those disciples and that we can't extend it to pastors today. I don't think there's many people saying this, but there are some people, I've heard this before, who are saying, oh, that was just for them. Um, and, and it sort of leads into the who do you think you are? Because it is actually, I'm talking about in the absolution. It's a very bold phrase. I say that I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's what Jesus says. If you forgive, if you withhold Come on, Eileen. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld, right? I, I'm the one doing this act. The disciples are the ones doing this act. Now, having said that, it's of course not like the disciples have, well, they do have special authority. Jesus just gave them special authority to do this, so they absolutely have it. Um, yeah, that's it. Jesus gave them special authority. So they do have special authority. I think that's the point. And so um, the, the who do you think you are is, are dumb questions. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just cut right to the chase. Um, I, I, I think Jesus gave me this job to do. That's who I think I am. Um, I, yeah, okay. I'll try to ease up a little bit, but at, at, at the end of it, Jesus told me to do this, so you gotta take it. That's that's about my pay grade. You gotta argue with uh, with Jesus himself. Now, anyway, Thomas is not with them. 
So any th those folks who say this was just for the original disciples would have to exclude Thomas. And I don't think I've ever heard a um, either they agree and that Thomas can't forgive sins, or they have to somehow weasel Thomas in with the group who wasn't there, but not pastors. So anyway, it, it's just sort of a um, it's a poor argument, I would say. Jesus gives this command to his disciples and doesn't, doesn't uh, intentionally exclude Thomas and says, I, I specifically said this so that Thomas wouldn't get to do it because Thomas is just an adjective. Um, but you guys get to No, no, it's, it's Christ's ongoing ministry to his people. So yes, I forgive sins because Jesus has said that I need to forgive your sins. Now, having said that, it is not because I have some uh, intrinsic power uh, of being God. And, and not that I have... See, I have to be very careful because Christ has exactly given me authority to forgive sins. So I can't say I don't have authority to forgive sins because that would be denying what Jesus just said in giving me authority to forgive sins. So I have to actually be very careful about saying what I don't have. I have Jesus' forgiveness. I think I need to say that. That's kind of what I'm trying to get around to. This is not, um, this, this is Jesus' forgiveness, right? This is earned by Jesus in his death and resurrection, and I'm the one who gets to actually do it. It's quite uh, an honor to be a part of this and to be able to carry out Christ's work here, here in this place. It's a great honor that Christ has given to me, and, and one that I will continue to do. Right. All right. Our friend Thomas. I'm going to be light on Thomas. Um, there's enough folks who are heavy on Thomas. Notice. He's a little more forceful. I mean, this whole thing. But he has the same witness as the rest of the disciples. Notice the parallel. 25, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Notice what Mary says in 18. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Oh, interesting. It's almost like those are identical passages. First person singular or plural. Oh, interesting. So my, my point is, cool it with, with the doubting Thomas. All right, um, that's my point. He's doing the same thing. As the other disciples, uh, they needed space to process the event of the resurrection. And so let's, let's be a little bit gracious to Thomas, who does give us a nice confession at the end. My Lord and my God. It's not like he's, well, I don't know if he's burning in hell. I would assume not. Um, I, I would assume not, yeah. Anyway, yes... He says something kind of silly that he probably regretted, but if if we if we go to hell for saying something silly that we probably regretted, then I don't think heaven will have any person in it, right? So let's let's be gracious to Thomas. All right. Now, verse twenty nine leads us directly into something something of an aside, a literary aside in thirty and thirty one, but but is nonetheless very important. So Jesus' words in verse 29. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Oh, interesting. That'd be like us. Who haven't, like, like most of the Christians, haven't actually seen Jesus. But we do get to hear about him. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. We get to hear Jesus' words. Again, the, the ending of Mark, which I did a devotion on a long time ago, strikes at this same point. We have the words of Christ, and that is sufficient. We don't need to have seen Christ. In the short ending of Mark, you don't get to see the risen Christ. But you have his words, and you're supposed to go forth with his words. And that's what John is telling, telling us right here. Lots, lots of other things happen. Lots of other stuff happened. 
Um, and we didn't put it in this book. But we did put these things in here so that you can hear Jesus' words and believe in him. Now, another kind of aside, which actually leads to a pretty profound point, is how we consider these other signs. And here's what I mean by it. Um, there is a tendency to kind of put the cart before the horse. And what I mean by that is to say that we have faith in the Bible as opposed to when we could just as well say we have faith in Christ. And now here's where this verse kind of talks about it. How do we, how do we think about these other signs? Um, were they good and true and right and helpful and holy and all those other adjectives that Jesus is? Well, yes, of course they were. Well, why were they not included in the Bible? I, I don't know, because uh, where does John say it in 21? I think he does. If all of his signs were written down, I suppose the world could not contain the number of volumes. Right. I, John's, I think it's John, says something very close to that. There was just a lot of stuff that he said and did, and we couldn't possibly write it all down. Now, the reason, the reason that I'm, and I, and I don't want it to seem adversarial, like, oh, you can't believe in the Bible, you have to believe in Jesus instead, is that if we, if we make the Bible uh, the basis of our beliefs, then we have to do something with these other signs. Oh, well, they weren't good enough to be recorded, or they, they were less important, or, or they, were, they were less something. Right? We have to do something. There was a reason they weren't included. They're, so we have a, a, a high tier of what Jesus said and did and a low tier, and these are in the low tier. Um, however, if Christ is, if we have faith in Christ, and if he is the foundation, then these other signs... Are fine, right? The Bible includes some of them, and the Bible gives us a, a true, reliable witness, right? It is these eyewitnesses, testimony about Jesus, and and there's other testimony, which is also true and good and right and accurate, which was not recorded. Now, if you want to get into uh, inspiration, that's sort of a different. A little bit different of a conversation. These uh, books being inspired, the the spirit wanting them to focus in one area versus another is not to say that some were more important or less important, but that some were. Uh, I guess you got to draw the line somewhere, right? You got to draw the line somewhere. Jesus did all of these numerous, numerous things. And the Spirit wanting us to focus upon these and not these other ones. Not that these other ones are bad or wrong or whatever. But everything that Jesus said is good and true. And yeah, there's some stuff. Uh, Paul, in one of his letters, a lot of hand-waving in this one, um, says, Just as our Lord said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Which Jesus said, because that's in the inspired text, but is not in any of the Gospels. And, and so it, it presents something of a problem that's not really a problem. Um, and the, the canon of the scripture is kind of a long, drawn-out thing, not, not quite as tidy as we might like it to be. But the fact is that Jesus is the basis for our faith. We have faith not in the Bible, because that's just words on a page. Um, hold on, let me say this whole thing. We have faith in Jesus, and those words on the page are testimony about Jesus, and they they allow us to have faith in Jesus. See, we get to um, we get to a pretty profound point from from this verse here. Our faith is in Jesus. The Bible tells us about Jesus, therefore, it is a good and reliable book. If we look at it the other way, we have to answer, well, why not the Quran? Or why not the Talmud? Or why not the Bhagavad Gita? I think that's the Hindu one. Like, why, why is our book more special than these other books? Well, it's the one we believe? That's kind of a stupid answer. It's true? Well, they all say they're true. 
But if Jesus is the foundation, then then anything that tells us about Jesus is good. Like a pastor's sermon, for example. Like the Bible, for example. These things tell us about Jesus. If Jesus is the foundation, then we want to hear more about it. Like these devotions, right? Are telling us, are telling you about Jesus. So a, a very, very subtle um, thing that, again, has kind of a profound impact, probably not one that many people think about, but, but one that is important nonetheless. Anyway, Jesus rises from the dead, gives this gift of ongoing ministry to his disciples, the forgiving and the retaining of sins, and, and um, bringing his disciples with him as they're processing the resurrection as they are trying to make sense of this, com coming to terms between believing, between the believing of verse 8 and the confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God, right? Trying to get, get that gap filled. All right. Good. The resurrection of Jesus. I think we're going to have one more, depending on how they divide up John 21. We might have one more in the Gospel of John, and then we'll be, we will be moving on to something new. Now, I think our Old Testament also ends, so we may jump back into the Old Testament. I'll just have to see how things shake out, but let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for rising from the dead and appearing to your disciples. We thank you for giving them the gift of trust in you and for conferring upon them the duty to forgive and retain sins. Give us a contrite heart, Lord. Allow us to confess our sins to you and receive the forgiveness in your name. We pray this in your name. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my kids are coming down and causing a ruckus, so. There, there's the proof for you. I'll see you next time. God's peace be with you.